Now, Micah is, it's an interesting book in how it's laid out. We're not going to get too much into the details. Um, I don't like to get too much into the historical speculations of, of who wrote what book. We, we, for the most part, take the names uh, to simply be that they are primarily the authors of those books. If not, they're about the person uh, that is at the title of that book that we have. Micah um, is... Has, it does have a pattern to it, but at the same time, it's, it's a little bit uh, jittery almost in, in the way that it expresses, um, that the writer expresses both the uh, expectation of holiness from God, his judgment, but then also the hope that we have. But it, it continues that cadence. Like what we see a lot of times in the Minor Prophets is, I mean, it's judgment, 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 like really bad stuff, more judgment, and then hope at the very, very end. Um, any of you that are familiar with uh, Lord of the Rings, it is uh, Helm's Deep, um, and then barely at the end you get uh, Gandalf coming over the hill and light then blossoms and kills all the orcs and it's violent, but it's wonderful, so it's okay. Um, but anyway, the, the whole idea is that where there is, though, uh, darkness and gloom, hope really of any kind, even if it's a future one, banked on promises, is exceedingly bright. That's something we need to remember. It's something that we need to remember in that, yes, we are called in some sense to push away darkness. But I want to remind you that even when we look at Paul, when it comes to the local church, when what he says for us to do as a people of God, when he charges the church to be more and better at evangelism, he tells the Christians to act more Christian. He doesn't say act like the world, but just make sure that your talking points are morally biblical. No, he charges regularly. When he even prays for the church to be more evangelistic, he is praying for the people of God to show up both in message and means and methods as Christian, distinctly so. Why is that? Because God is holy. God is holy. God is holy, perfect, good, and true. Certainly along the way, in the expression of his holiness, there's going to be justice. We saw this at the Exodus, right? So they go across the Red Sea, and then God causes the waters to drown out uh, Pharaoh's army. And certainly there's judgment, protection. There's all manner of things that are going on there. Certainly it is in God's disposal to enact justice as he does. And sometimes certainly does use the hand um, or even whether you want to call it the fist or even the sword of other nations to bring justice or discipline or even judgment to other nations. We see that readily throughout the minor prophets. And it's the hard part is you can often see a godless nation, perhaps one that even is more godless, so to speak, than even his own people, but he'll use that nation against his own people of Israel and Judah. But they're going to get theirs. But it's not about vengeance, but it is about his justice and his holy requirements. And basically what we have to understand is that nothing that we do before God is a relativistic perspective when it comes to holiness. We're, it's not because we are better than or more moral than anybody that has been created by God. It's whether or not we measure up to God's standard of holiness, always. We say this around here quite a bit. It's never about whether or not you're as good as your grandmother or your friend or your coworker. It's whether or not you are as good as Christ, because he's the only one that God made the statement that this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. He is satisfied, okay? Everything he did in life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, satisfied the holiness of God. Even the book of Hebrews says that when Christ performed all that, he went to the holy places, not the images, not the types, not the shadows like a tent or a tabernacle. No, he went to the heavenly places and prepared us for that place there by saying, by my standard, Father, all these will be yours. And it satisfied a holy, pure God. Micah is from Moresheth. It's a town southwest of Jerusalem in the southern kingdom of Judah. His name actually means who is like the Lord. In fact, it's basically an Old Testament derivative of Michael that you might have in the New Testament. Um, he prophesied at a time that you would be pretty familiar with because it's actually prior to the Assyrian attack on the northern kingdom. Well, really, it, they attacked both kingdoms, but they took captive the northern kingdom. But it also is around that period that Isaiah 
prophesize. Okay, so, um, and again, just because it's called minor prophets, don't think minor league prophet. Um, and then where you have a major league prophet like Isaiah, that's not how this works. But simply this very focused perspective during this tenure of Micah is very, very clear what he's saying. Even if it's a reiteration of much of what we see in Isaiah, he is still being very clear and very pointed to say, this is why God is going to judge the northern kingdom. And actually during his time, this is sometime between uh, around 722 and then uh, to the early like 702 uh, BC is that's actually when the Assyrians actually attacked. And so again, if you remember, the reason that they didn't, didn't actually take captive the southern kingdom of Judah was God was first of all protecting them, but he protected them by giving wisdom, uh, strategic wisdom even to Hezekiah to guard and protect that southern kingdom. But it was still going to be short-lived. Because eventually when Babylon would come in, then that would not just decimate the northern kingdoms, which is what happened during the Assyrian captivity. But once Babylon came in, there basically would be no identity of the children of Israel uh, again for a long period of time once they were taken then into captivity. So in the course of all this, we see that Jerusalem uh, has been spared the Assyrian conquering. He, God has used people like Hezekiah to do so. Micah, in articulating what's happening to the north, we end up seeing that God is still going to faithfully execute both judgment and mercy. He's going to do both of these things regularly because those are both expressions of his holy character. And one of the difficulties of this is understanding how in the world is mercy an expression of God's holiness? Because in contemporary day and age, when we think of mercy, we think of accepting people as they are, perhaps even in their sinful choices or even sinful lifestyle choices or practices. But that's not what mercy is. Mercy certainly would be, yes, showing kindness to all and being hospitable with all. But in the midst of it, we also very mercifully and lovingly and kindly speak the truth that in order for mercy to be an expression of a holy God, then it has to be on holy standards, which then the mercy is that Jesus Christ came to save sinners like me and like you. Because that is how holiness and mercy mix, is that holiness is satisfied. Sin is never overlooked. It's actually paid for, cared for, removed, but it must be done. The mercy then is saying this is afforded to you so that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We get all of these hints in this wonderful book of Micah. These main themes of judgment and mercy that forgiveness reigns in there helps us see that in the midst of it, there are these constant themes that God remains holy. He remains sovereign. He is going to charge his people to live rightly and he doesn't cut them slack for uh, misunderstanding what it means to be even the chosen. They took that to mean there's almost nothing they could do to step outside of God's favor, so to speak. And yet he's saying, no, he's actually coming against them in judgment because they have elevated the things of the world and they've even oppressed the poor on the way. Their pride has been oozing out all over the place as a result of everything going so well. But then the, the hoofbeats of the Assyrian army begin to pound towards the northern kingdom. And Micah is saying, this is why. He warns the kingdoms of this coming judgment of Assyria. He even hints at the coming judgment of Babylon even to the south. But his focus is on the north for the most part. He indicts the kingdoms on their idolatries. The fact that they have actually embraced other gods, even as you, we read. Even as Tim was reading, you, you see in here that, I mean, it's not like Ahaz was, I mean, I mean, you talk about <laughs> the threat of punishment. I don't know how many kids he had, but he sacrificed some of his kids to idols, okay? And not to make light of that, but whatever kids were left, man, I promise you they were great. They were obedient. I don't know what was going on, but it was awful that a king in a kingdom that even had Israel as a title would practice something that was considered to be so demonically rooted. And yet that's how far it went. But do you know that when it started, that we see the hints of this even all the way back in the Exodus, right? When you see them fashioning a golden calf. But do you remember that when they fashioned the golden calf and Aaron even was standing there kind of letting all things go, they weren't necessarily worshiping the false god of the golden calf of Egypt. 
But they, in their fear and a lack of faith of God's promises, they wanted something to look at, something to invest in, but even still try to worship the God that they knew in their history, but through a graven image. So even though their ends might have been noble, the means were vile. God's holy standards will not suffer that for long. And the earth swallowed up a bunch. He's not going to cut us slack because by nature he is holy in every single regard. And if we are going to live holy lives, that means we live lives of faith, trusting that God's ends and God's means should mark the follower of Jesus Christ. So with this aim of warning the northern kingdoms and explaining why this is happening, why this is going on in their judgment, we see this overarching question of what is it in the end then that God really wants? Because it seems like his standard is unattainable. You know, what do you want from us, so to speak? If we're not your chosen, and of course, again, they misunderstood the nature of what it meant to be chosen. Thinking that it meant some kind of shield because almost misconstruing why God chose them in the first place, if you remember, what we get from Moses is that God simply says, I love them because I love them. It's not because they are good or great. It's on no other basis besides the sheer merciful love of God. Isn't this where we veer as believers, as followers? That sometimes we can grow casual in our understanding of what it means to resist sin, to kill sin. Somewhere in there, as, as we went through Second Peter, in Second Peter 1, 9, when he says, if you fail at any one of these seven things, then it's because you've forgotten what it means to be forgiven of former sins. There's something in there that we have this pride that basically says, you know what, I kind of I deserve to be like this. I kind of deserve to be a Christian. You would never say it out loud. But when we sin and do not treat our sinfulness with severity, our sin, then we are saying that we are not that different than the children of Israel who misunderstood what it meant to be chosen. It is only by the grace of God. It's not because you were savable. And we need to remember what it means to be forgiven of former sins as God is calling his people to here. So what does God want? Well, essentially what God wants is he's going to have a habitation. And because God is holy, that means what God wants is a holy people to inhabit. If you remember how this thing's played out through redemptive history, we have all these examples of we have God with them in the garden, walking with them. Then there's a break, there's a fall. Okay, and in that fall, there's all kinds of attempts of men to try to reach back to God, but not based on God's standards, based on men's standards. Let's build Babel. Let's build something to erect that we can take pleasure in and basically say we reached out to God. And God frustrates those efforts again and again and again. So then when he does, does then reestablish the relationship with his people and they leave in a wilderness, what does he do? They establish these booths or what are called tents of meeting that are temporary, but it still was to represent God's presence with his people, even in the midst of a wilderness. Well, then finally, when they do establish themselves in the promised land, eventually they erect a temple. It's beautiful. David couldn't do it, but Solomon does. It's beautiful. It's established. But again, what happens is it's not about God inhabiting buildings. He wants to be around his people, but the people do not maintain a holy practice very long, according to God's standards. And things get destroyed, things get divided, and here we are into the minor prophets. Well, eventually what we know happens is Christ refers to himself as a temple when he comes incarnate. For in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt. Or in the Greek, that word means a verb form of tabernacled with his people among us. He tabernacled among us. And even later in his ministry, he would tell them, if you tear this temple down in three days, it will rise up. John explains it very clearly. He's not talking about the temple, although that's what they were hearing, that, hey, what do you mean? We've rebuilt this temple and it's taken us decades, hundreds of years, basically, to reestablish this. But John makes clear what he was talking about was the temple of his body. And he was referring to the resurrection. But what else then after Christ raises from the dead? 
or is raised from the dead, we then see the epistles of Paul especially lean hard into, you are a building, you are a structure, you are stones. According to Ephesians, we see it in Galatians, um, where you are stones being built together on the cornerstone of Christ. And you are now the city on a hill. You are now the one who's been established as his dwelling place. And you are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, glorify God with your body. We see where this was all going from the first place is to indwell or tabernacle the people of God, the people of his covenant. God dwelling with his people is God's desire. And what we see in Micah is this kind of intermittent in the midst of time fact that in order for God to dwell with his people, the people, the tabernacle the ho- has to be a holy place. Well, and and like we said, that first is established on the fact that God is indeed holy. The word of the Lord, starting in verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Micah of Morsheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear you peoples, all of you. Pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it, and let the Lord God be a witness against you. The Lord from his holy temple. Okay, hang on to that. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth and the mountains will melt under him and the valleys will split open like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And that is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap in the open country, a place for planting vineyards. And I will pour down her stones into the valley and uncover her foundations. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces and her wages shall be burned with fire. And her, all her idols I will lay waste. Now, when he says all her idols, he's already referring to some of them. Because they had gone back to false idols and, and had literally built statues to false gods, but they also found idolatry in their wealth. And, and the thing that's really crazy is that they actually used, they prostituted the false gods, and that's how they gained their wealth. Now, the priests and the leaders would try to say that this wealth was a good thing because they could do more with it. But what they did more with it was simply sin more. Therefore, I will make Samaria... Oh, I'm sorry, let me go on down. Um, And he says, And uh, for from the fee of a prostitute she gathered them, and to the fee of a prostitute they shall return. For this I will lament and wail. I will go... I will go stripped and naked. I will make lamentation like the jackals and mourning like the ostriches. For her wound is incurable and it has come to Judah. It has reached to the gate of my people to Jerusalem. Again, that's a reference to this will make its way and has made its way even into the southern kingdom that feels as if they're a little bit shielded because of how much of God's judgment is being poured out on the north. Tell it not in Goth. Weep not at all. And Bethla Afra, roll yourselves in the dust, pass on your way, inhabitants of Shafir, in nakedness and shame, the inhabitants of Zanan, do, do not come uh, out. And the lamentation of Beth Ezel shall take away from you its standing place, for the inhabitants of Morath uh, wait anxiously for good, because disaster has come down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. Harness the steeds to the chariots, inhabitants of Lachish. It, it was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, for in you were formed the transgressions of Israel. That's the north. Therefore, you shall give parting gifts to Morasheth Goth. The houses of Exib shall be the deceitful thing to the kings of Israel. I will again bring a conqueror to you, inhabitants of Morshah. The glory of Israel shall come to Adullam, which is not good. It'll come to ash, basically. Make yourselves bald and cut off your hair for the children of your delight. Make yourselves as bald as the eagle, for they shall go from you into exile. So again, I mean, the picture he's painting about Assyria coming and that what's basically, it's going to strip them naked of everything that they depend on and have lavished in, it's really, really clear. 
And he's also saying this type of thing is also going to make its way into the South. Why? Again, because of the sin of essentially pride and idolatry, even though it's expressed in different ways between the Northern and the Southern kingdoms. Now, in chapter 2, he goes on, he says, Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. Okay, basically, man, that's what they wake up thinking about. The Proverbs also warn us of these types of people. They don't wake up dreaming or being content with the face of God. They think and consider about ways they can take advantage of other people for their own selfish gain. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away. They oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, against this family, I am devising disaster from which you cannot remove your necks and you shall not walk haughtily for it will, it will be a time of disaster in that day that they shall take up a taunt song against you and, a, and moan bitterly and say, we are utterly ruined. He changes the portion of my people, how he removes it from me to an apostate, he allots our fields. Therefore, you will have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord. He is saying you will have no place. And the place that you have will actually be taken by even those who don't believe in God. It's going to appear like a grand injustice, but their only basis for that would be because they're God's chosen people. But it all again is rooted in not understanding what it meant to be chosen. God demands holiness. He then says in verse 6, he says, do not preach, thus they preach. One should not preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake us. Should this be said, O house of Jacob, the preachers and the prophets of their age were actually doubling down on this misunderstanding of what it meant to be God's chosen people. They were false teachers of what the kingdom of God included and who the kingdom of God included. And as they were preaching these things, as men who were set aside as religious leaders or preachers, pastor types, we see that God's judgment will come against them strongly. Verse 7, should this be said, O house of Jacob, has the Lord grown impatient? Are these his deeds? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? But lately my people have risen up as an enemy. You strip the rich robe from those who pass by trustingly with no thought of war. The women of my people you drive out from their delightful houses, from their young children you take away my splendor forever. Arise and go, for this is no place to rest." Because of uncleanness that destroys with a grievous destruction, if a man should go about and utter wind and lies, saying, I will preach to you of wine and strong drink, he would be the preacher for this people. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. He who opens the breach goes up before them. They break through and pass the gate, going out by it. The king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. So even at the end of the, and this is part of one of those jittery structures I was telling you about. So he's saying, here's all the bad, but instead of waiting till the very end of his prophecy, of what we have with the book of Micah, we have basically this little glimmer, you know, the Gandalf over the hill at Helm's Deep coming here at the very, very end of just chapter two, that God is going to bring to himself a remnant, but it's not going to be based on the kind of truth that's being taught them by these preachers and pastors. So what all this establishes simply is this, and I read all of that so that we could simply understand this simple structure and this main point of these first two chapters. First of all, God is holy. So God wants for himself a holy people, So we have to understand, first of all, that God is holy. That's why he wants it. It's his nature, it's who he is, and it's what he does. It's infinite, it is unstoppable, it is indefensible. We have to decide by which standard do we know God. Is it yours? Because that's what he's contending with them in chapter 2. They're listening to preachers tell them what they want to hear. Or is it God? Are we reconciled to him or are we trying to twist and turn things to make it reconciled to us? Oh, well, if God is good, then he won't judge anyone for what they were just simply born to think like or to want or to desire. And yet we are all born sinners. It doesn't surprise me at all that someone would consider themselves born with a proclivity for any particular type of sin. I have have my own kind of in a sense, pre-born uh, tendencies. There's some I don't understand, 
But as a sinner, that doesn't mean, though, that I am not required to choose by God's grace whether or not I will follow God. If I remain in my birth state, so to speak, of sinfulness and express it in any manner of ways, then I am then choosing to simply remain the person that I was born. And instead of shaking a fist at God, I have to understand, I am a sinner by nature at birth, and then I am a sinner by choice the second I am able to articulate a word. We forget this. We forget that we need the invasion, the interruption in our time of the Holy Spirit to awaken us to our sin and our need for a Savior. This is not something that we come to naturally. God is holy. He wants a holy people to dwell in their midst. I remind you again, this is not because God is lonely out there in the ethereal cosmos at all. He is perfectly happy within the Godhead of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But he wants his glory to be shown and put on display. But he, he cannot, if there is something God cannot do, he cannot compromise his holy character for the sake of showing his glory through the people of his redemption. So when he redeems them, his holiness must be satisfied. And what they've come to this place of understanding is that it's the word of the Lord that has come to them. This infinite mercy that God would extend his holy word to such an unholy people. We see the images here of the word that's coming out of the mouth of Micah to what we will eventually see when Christ comes at Christmas and puts on flesh. The word became flesh. Every time we have it, thus saith the Lord in the Old Testament, it is a type, so to speak, a typology, and, and, and not an allegory because it actually happened, but it's an allusion to what's going to happen when the very word of God is embodied in the person of Christ, who then maintains his full divinity, but takes on full and total humanity. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us. This constancy of God's holy condescension to people to bring the truth of hope is consistent throughout Scripture. And it's a drumbeat that eventually leads itself to the Christmas story. God's holy character demands that sin not be overlooked, but that sin be judged. The wages of sin is death. Now, it may not happen in immediacy, but no matter what we may consider to be slowness, God will judge all sin and sinners before it's all said and done. If you look at 10 through 15, as we've read in chapter 1, he goes through, and, and when, he, when he runs through this, he's pointing out these various cities that are taken by Assyria, showing that there will be this conquering, this exile in judgment. This is how God's going to do it at this point. And even then, it's temporary. Both the judgment is temporary, but so is, in a sense, the restoration that he refers to. At the end of chapter 2, when he talks about, I'm going to gather this remnant back to Jerusalem. Yes, he will. But it's not even the full and final regathering he's going to do, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So if God is holy, and we know that it's a beautiful condescension of God to bring to us the word of his holy character and what has to be done in both judgment and restoration in order for these people to be holy, we then have to understand that he is speaking this holiness not to people who understand it, but to people who are actually sinful. So simply, God is holy, people are sinners. That's the gist of it. In verses 1 through 5 of chapter 2, when he says, Woe to the oppressors, he says, Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. And then he goes down, like in verse 3, he says, Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, against the family I am devising disaster, for it will be a time of disaster. In that day they shall take up a taunt song against you. And then he goes on in verse 5, Therefore you will have none to, to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord. There is going to be such a division that basically the discernible will of God is not even going to be possible because God is not even in their sight. Not even historically. That's how far they go in their lack of holiness. In fact, no matter how much we might have the language of the church or language of God on our lips, when we are living in sin, we are by all practicality, full out, full blown idol worshipers. Every single 
time. The corruption of wealthy pursuits, that's what they're going out. That's what they're trying to figure out. How can I take advantage of this family? How can I take their homes? How can I take their property for the sake of my wealth? God is saying, that's what you are doing. And I'm coming against you on that. That is more fruit bearing, but this is the fruit bearing of their sinful corruption that he is pointing out. They are building up a kingdom of heaven for themselves on earth on their basis. They are reconciling basically everything to themselves as if they are God. They're building their wealth, their kingdom, and it's always at the expense of the oppressed and the weak. Every single time. They are working out in their minds, even while they're still in their beds, ways that they can take advantage of other people to build up their own kingdoms. That's how people think who do not have the interruption of the holy mercy of God. Now, it really gets telling here that even though that's their pursuit, the reason that's happened really is articulated in verses 6 to 11 of chapter 2. And he says it's because they have rejected the word of God. It's not just the absence of right preaching, but the presence of false teaching that's occurred here. He says, do not preach, thus they preach. One should not go preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake us. They're going around and these preachers, these false preachers, these false teachers in their midst are saying, don't worry, God is with us still, even though there's nothing about their pursuits that is actually glorifying or honoring of God. We see this happen around the world all the time. Just because the name of God is attached to some movement or some thought or some ideology absolutely does not make it Christian. There are some who may say this about leadership in Hungary. There are some that would say this about leadership even in Russia. The fact is, is that even though they have leaders of their state religiously say that God is behind what we're doing, either in Ukraine or Hungary, when they actually execute people who are against their political leadership. But they'll say, oh, this is, more, this is as much of a Christian nation as you might find elsewhere in the world, like America. Because we're giving into this, we're giving into that. God's holy character is not anointing a nation that actually oppresses the poor, steps over them, and even kills anyone who's opposing to them and their ideologies. And that's not even a political statement. That's just literally an illustration of what's going on here in the text. You cannot have a holy end and unholy means and claim that God is behind it. It's not true. People are sinful. They are corrupt in what they go after and they are corrupt in who they put before them to teach them what they want to hear. God takes his word seriously because his holy character is placed in the characteristics of the words. And when someone stands saying that I'm representing God before you with these words, but what they utter is ungodly, it is not just the punishment upon those who will bear that millstone around their necks and be buried, the teachers. It also comes down on those who suffered or listened and accepted the teaching. God will not just judge the false teacher. He will judge the false receivers of that teaching. We need to be careful. See, really for some of us, what this can be is almost a, a points of entry to reverse engineer where we are with God. So basically we ask ourselves, okay, what do I wake up thinking about? What do I dream about even in the morning? Not, I mean, not to get too technical about how to apply this, but is my first thought, here's what I can do in sin or here's what I can do for me and mine or is it something that might smell a little bit more like the Bible when it comes to good expressions of holy character and mercy and compassion or is it something you're looking for another angle on how you can gain at the expense perhaps even of others well that's an entry point for you to think okay man now that I'm hearing that I'd my first thought is not of the Lord, first of all. Now, it may not be to go to that extreme of building up kind of my own kingdom, but it's definitely not of God. That's an entry point for reverse engineering and going, you know what, I need, I'm far away from you right now, Lord. Forgive me. Or what about false teaching? What about the books that you go after? You hunt on Amazon and look for something. Are you looking for things that match up with what you want to hear? 
Okay, I did this with Andy this morning up in the sound booth. I had to move some, we were moving some things around and I moved over one of the, one of the flowers and it just didn't look right over here. And so I said, Andy, what do you think? And he goes, you know, it's a little out of balance. Or right. I said, Andy, I needed you to just tell me that I was uncomfortable with it and you need to agree with me. So, and then, you know, and it was great. We have a wonderful relationship when those things line up. And so anyway, it was just a funny moment, but it still was illustrative of this idea that we do definitely love it when people agree with us. But when it comes down to teaching the truth as it comes from God, guys, this is why that even in the poorest countries on the face of the planet, the prosperity gospel and its demonism and its erroneous teaching can thrive. Joel Osteen's, Benny Hinn's, so many others that teach and proclaim a prosperity gospel of have enough faith and you can have this and have that. It's amazing to me that people who literally, even if they have everything in their culture, it would seem incredibly impoverished compared to what we have at our disposal. And yet these things can thrive in some of the poorest places in Mexico, some of the poorest countries in Africa. It's because at the end of the day, people will gather around for themselves the teachers that tell them what they want to hear. We must hear the gospel because we are sinful. If you entertain false teaching, then what you're doing is saying, God must be reconciled to me on my standard, not me to his. He takes his word seriously, and the word of God must be taken seriously by those who hear. There were messages of overindulgence in verse 10, arise and go for this is no place to rest because of uncleanness that destroys with the grievous destruction. If a man should go about and utter wind and lies saying, I will preach to you of wine and strong drink, he would be the preacher of this people. And it's really, honestly, it's not really about drinking per se. It's more about they're going to preach and drink as almost an act of worship and rejoice in that over doing anything that, that requires them to submit to God. It goes back to that Jeremiah 2 ideal of we have forsaken the fountain of living waters and hewned out for ourselves cisterns that can hold no water. We've replaced or displaced God with something that is temporary that we have to keep doing again and again because the fulfillment doesn't last. The rejection of God's word is always the point of sin and is the end. The rejection of God's word is always a result of sin. It works both ways. Satan did this in the garden. Certainly when he questioned, did God really say this? It wasn't just the question initially that he, brought, that, he, that he raised and that they sinned against. It was also what ended up happening as a result of. They rejected God's word as a result. So they heard the temptation from Satan. Is this really what God meant? So there's the question raising whether or not you should reject. And then they actually sin. And then though, as a result though, they actually then actually reject God's word in other ways. That's how sin works. There are results that end up happening when we get to chapter 7 at the end of our time. I think it'll be uh, the last Sunday of this month uh, when we look at, at the last sermon on Micah. We'll see how there are broken homes, broken marriages, that wealth, the wealthy taking advantage of the poor and basically the richer getting even richer and the poor, and, and that's even shrinking the number of those, and the poor expanding, but also the poorest getting even poorer. These are all a result of what happens when God's, when, <laughs> when people who reject the word of God begin to live, not in holy living, but in self-living. And this is then what God does. He removes all of it. So what we then have to understand is what he hints at as hope in 12 and 13. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. Again, that's referencing the larger group, but even in the north, I will set them together like a sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. He who hopes, who opens the breaches goes up before them. They break through the, and pass the gate going out by it. Their king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. What this makes very clear is I will do this, says the Lord. God is holy, men are sinners, and only God can make sinful men holy. 
It is literally our only hope is for God to intervene. He is the one that will establish the remnant because he is bringing upon them a judgment that is insurmountable. They cannot recover on their own at all. They are being assaulted by an army and a future army in Babylon that will take over all of them and will, dis- will completely destroy or disseminate any idea of what it means to be the 12 tribes of Israel. He is going to gather them back together. The Assyrian siege would essentially wipe out the northern kingdom. In Jeremiah 31, 10, in fact, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it to the coastlands far away. He who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. And like most Old Testament prophets, as they see this regathering, there is a temporal aspect and there's also an eternal one. And what I mean temporally is that, yes, there is a temporal restoration that ends up occurring. At the end of all this, and after Persia attacks and says, we don't really need all these extra slaves, let's send all of them back to their homeland. And in a sense, through Ezra and Nehemiah, you have a reestablishment of the remnant of whoever's left of all of Israel. No more northern and southern kingdom. They're all just residing in in Jerusalem, and they're rebuilding the walls and reestablishing practices according to the word. And it lasted about 20 years. Over and over and over again, there are these temporal restorations, but they're never meant to be eternal until, until in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. He's he said, he's prophesied, God's going to gather his flock back together. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And, and check this out. This is the eternal part of the temporal restoration. He says, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. voice so there will be one flock and one shepherd. Get that. No more separation. So so temporally, what do we see? When he restores his people temporally that Mike is prophesying about, the remnant that he's going to bring back together, we see that happen temporally and there's, there's no more division of kingdoms. They all come back to Jerusalem under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah. And it seems good, even though there's a lot of work to be done, but it doesn't last. They begin to mix them with other gods again because when things get hard, they go where the money is. But in the future, in the eternal, finally, no longer a shepherd coming through the words of a prophet. We have the shepherd who embodies himself in flesh in Christ. And he comes and lays down his life for the sheep. Oh, but then we start to understand the nature of this flock. There's other folds. It's not just of those and that remnant of Jerusalem or, or, or of Israel. It is now those of the Gentiles. But get what he said. He doesn't say there's two folds of one flock. He just says there's one flock. His holy nation that he will restore that is eternal. The remnant that he will bring back to himself. And this is the mystery of the gospel as Paul points out. Is that it's actually a flock that's inclusive of all Jews who have acknowledged that Jesus is the Christ. And all Gentiles to realize you can also be a covenant keeping Jew by acknowledging that Jesus is the Christ. And when he reestablishes that remnant, oh that's for good. And only those who make their way into that flock are those who have trusted that Christ and Christ alone can make them holy to stand before the Father. Only God can make sinful people holy. And he wants a people to dwell with. This is the joy of what we get to do both every week as Christians when we gather with the saints to say, look, all of us Gentiles, maybe some converted Jews even in the room, whatever, we're all one flock now. He's making for himself one people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. But especially maybe at Christmas, we get to remember that when he came, he is clarifying, he is defining the nature of remnant. He's clarifying the nature of flock. He is making for himself what it means to be a holy people inhabited by God. And it's for any who call upon the name of the Lord. 
What a promise. Revelation 7, 17 says, For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The doxology in Hebrews. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead the Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. So God is holy. We're sinners. Only God can make people holy. What are we to do? Well, if you're a Christian, you should strive to live holy lives. Pretty simple. Holy is this being a called out one, is being separate and being marked by the characteristic of God. And again, since it's not based on you and your behaviors, you can't become holy or you can't be holy and therefore think that's going to make you acceptable to God. Holiness and holy living is fruit of whether or not God has made you his own through Christ. So therefore, if someone who claims to be a Christian but has no ambition, they have no desire to pursue holiness, to both reject sin but also embrace the satisfaction that you find only in a holy God, it's very likely that their profession of being a Christian is false. We, we all are going to sin at times, but part of the holy living of even a Christian who sins is a response to warnings and the conviction of sin. And then what we do is we remember that Jesus doesn't need to die again. What he did once was for always for me. But look, perhaps you are here, and this is a time of year you've decided to amp up your church attendance. You being around church people, you being even watching online and taking some time out of your morning to watch a Christian, what we hope to be a clearly a Christian message that will not draw you closer to God simply by the act. Not until you receive the truth of what's been said. God is holy. I am a sinner. And only God can make me holy. And the way he did that was Jesus Christ came, took on flesh, lived perfectly, died. That judgment I deserve, he took. The full brunt of it. But then he rose from the dead so that there's no, there's no other way, no other reason. So then we have to ask ourselves, if he is holy and he perfectly did all this, what could I possibly add to what he's done? And the fact is, you absolutely cannot add a thing. You are a recipient. You, you, well, you're a corpse. You're an enemy of Christ. These are all things that, that the Bible says of us. He even says, we're of our father, Satan. I mean, it, it, it's pretty gloomy when you look at what the life is of someone who has not come to faith yet. But then when he invades your space, when he invades your life and reminds you of his holiness, the impossibility of you getting to him, but then hearing the hope of the word of God that Jesus Christ died and came to save sinners like you and me, then you place your hope in him, then you have absolutely. It's not him whitewashing your characteristics. No, he displaces you and you then have the holiness of Christ in you. And that's what God looks upon and says, that's enough. They're one of mine. Christ in you, the hope of glory. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you for your word and for these reminders, uh, even of old, that, that, that do clearly remind us that when we reject your word and the proclamation of your word, when we reject the truths of what the word says, um, that you are holy and that we are sinners in need of being saved. And if we reject what the word says, um, but also what the word embody, which is basically when Christ came and reject him as the sole um, means by which we could have the hope of salvation. And we think that somehow we can do it. We can somehow perform holy acts. And then somehow you'll look comparatively as to others who are worse than us and say, well, they're good enough. I'll let them in. There's nothing about your holiness that's just good enough. It's perfect through and through. And only a perfect Savior can save perfect sinners. I mean, we sin perfectly in every regard. So God, I pray that you'd bring some to faith even right now. I pray that you'd bring them to an understanding that you are holy, they are sinners, and only Christ could bridge that gap and make us holy before a holy God forgiving us of our sin, having already judged our sin through his death on the cross. 
And God, for the Christian, please remind us, as Peter charged us, that when we do fail, it's because we've forgotten what it means to be forgiven of former sins. We have grown lazy in thinking that uh, it was not a miracle, perhaps, that it was not a resurrection when we came to know you, even if we grew up in a Christian home. No, God, there's nothing natural about the development of someone becoming a Christian. It's spiritually violent, actually, but... For some of us who were blessed with growing up in a Christian home, we are grateful for that, but it was still a transformation from death to life. So God, remind us of these things so that we can humbly follow you, both to our ends and the means, to reflect your holy character in a world that needs your mercy. It's in Christ's name we pray these things, amen.